might think that the people who put the lectionary together, the folks who drew up the plans that appoint for us the readings that we hear every Sunday morning, had some kind of a plan. We live in a time rich with conspiracy thinking, where people are easily convinced that there are layers beneath layers beneath layers of nefarious intent behind things, and many, many creatures fall into the trap of thinking that the lectionary is a kind of conspiracy of meaning, that the job of preaching is the task of ferreting out the true meaning of what the people who chose the lessons were trying to say. Well, that turns out to be just plain false. The lectionary we have is really just a way of making progress through different sections of the scriptures. In the Old Testament, for the past few weeks, we've been hearing the stories about the kingship of Israel, with Samuel anointing Saul, the first king, and then the emergence of David as the man upon whom God's favor falls. In the epistles, which we didn't hear this morning, we begin today a march through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, something we're going to continue with until after Father Austin returns. And because we're in the second year of the lectionary cycle this year, we've been hearing lessons from the Gospel of Mark, that second of the Gospels in the synoptic tradition. So all we're really doing is moving down three simultaneous tracks at different rates of speed. Any similarity between these readings is purely coincidental. Except wouldn't you just know? Among these randomly chosen readings this morning, there is actually a hint of a unifying theme. I wonder if you spot what it is. It's not dancing. In the first reading we heard this morning, David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant to a new home near his own house. The story tells us that he dances with all his might as the Ark makes its way to its new home. It's like a crazed procession through the streets with the king leading the way. One of the people who sees this spectacle is a woman named Michael. She is the daughter of King Saul, the king whom David has defeated and replaced. But even more complicated, she is the wife of King David. They had married when things were a little happier between David and Saul. And the very brief appearance we get of her in the reading this morning tells us that she looks out a window and sees David leaping and dancing before the ark. And then it says, and she despised him. Now, maybe she thinks he's just celebrating himself, giving himself something that in much later century, centuries, Emperors here in Rome would call a triumph. Maybe she's just angry that this is the man who deposed her father from the throne. But what is clear from the story and from what follows in the story that unfolds from there that we didn't hear this morning is that this is a woman living with a spiritual malaise of deep and profound resentment. Later on, the story tells us she ridicules David for what he has done. And David's reply is simply to say he would do it again. But the last thing we hear about Michael is this. She never bears children. It is as though the depth of her resentment shuts down that part of her that is life-giving. Resentment is also the driving force in the story we just heard about the execution of John the Baptist and Mark Gospel, the family of King Herod. Let's just say it is a blended family. Both he and his wife divorced their first spouses to marry each other. And to make matters worse, Herodias' first husband 
is her present husband's brother. Herod is supposed to be a leader of the Jewish people. He's supposed to be a man who both advocates and lives by the covenant code that makes the Jewish people chosen. The whole arrangement is offensive to the Jewish people. They feel let down by their own king. And John had partially criticized both Herod and his wife Herodias for the choices they had made. 2,000 years later, even our very contemporary sensibilities are a little bit you know, put on edge by this arrangement. It sure would make for an awkward family reunion. The story reads like something out of an opera. Herodias has a daughter who is also named Herodias, or in some account, Salome. And we all know what happens in the story, but what is important is why it happens. It happens because of resentment. The resentment of that woman toward a man who has called her out for her choices. In the first story, the story about David, resentment causes such a soul sickness that it stops the possibility of life. In the second story, it festers into something that causes death. And friends, before we just set these two old stories aside as just more Bible stories for Sunday morning, let's just stop and remember. Almost every resentment we feel, we experience as righteousness. Michael thought she was on the side of decency and order. Herodias thought she needed to defend her family and her choices. Those things are not wrong in themselves. But the moment we start feeling resentment that others are misunderstanding us or mistreating us, we start to get into trouble. Because the easiest thing in the world for us to do is to decide we are right as a way of distancing ourselves from honest self-examination. And that feeling of resentment is often the first and best symptom of spiritual sickness. None of us, none of us want to think of ourselves as people who act badly or think badly. We sit back in sorrow and sadness at all the evil, all the sorrow, all the sheer human misery there is in our world. The golden rule is having a hard time of it these days. But never do we imagine ourselves to have any part of it. It is both our great skill and our great curse that we are hardwired to justify ourselves, to regard ourselves as good and decent people. We are not so good at honest and fearless self-examination. We hesitate to light the bonfire of our own family. How can we be better at avoiding this all too human trend? How can we be people who come to a more honest assessment of ourselves, to have the discipline of seeing ourselves more like God sees us? That is a frightening idea, because if we saw things that way, we'd be brought face to face with the desperate reality of our own circumstances. We have been struggling with this problem for 2,000 years. And it is not clear that we, in our own day, have come up with answers any better than our ancestors arrived at. Certainly, we have deeper insights into human behavior today, but we are not really that much better at improving. The wisdom of our faith is the reminder that we should always walk through this world with humility, with the simple, disciplined, practiced recognition that our choices are imperfect, our 
wills are easily distracted, our best intentions are often pathways to our death. Baptism, our baptism, the scriptures tell us, are an appeal to God for a good conscience. And if we take that gift seriously, then we are equipped in our baptism with the single most important tool for coming to a right estimate of ourselves and our choices, our conscience. So if feelings of resentment are always a warning sign of spiritual danger, then the regular practice, the daily practice of checking in with our own conscience, calling to mind our own frailty, not the same thing of shoring up our own self-justification. That is the path the Holy Spirit has given us, the gift of a good conscience, to shield us against that.